Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Well, hey there, family. Give me Jesus. And you know what? We like Richard Hickam, too, so we'll go ahead and extend it at least another week. (laughs) How about another 10 years? I'm at least that. I mean, you've got Andy's record to catch up with, right? So you're a youngin'. I guess that makes me a super youngin'. Well, family, we are... uh, On the penultimate uh, Sabbath of our Great Question series, but I like it so much, I am telling Tammy it must come back again, because this has been fun. You ask good questions, and it's been fun uh, trying uh, to give you good answers. So today's question, in case you don't remember from last week, the question that was posed, I actually got two options. You guys were so nice, you gave me two options opportunities to, to really, um, let's see, I don't know what the right word is, um, uh, to challenge me. Let's do that. So how do we as a church stay focused on Jesus when so many in our denomination believe that our mission is to fixate on major, don't we wish it was just major, doctrinal issues, political hot potatoes, and or cultural preferences? Good question great question. But I had another question. I had that I can get, I get to pick. This is really fun. So the second, this, the other option was as someone not raised Seventh-day Adventist, I've embraced the warmth and freedom I've found at Whole Life Church. However, I've heard that our church is different from other Adventist churches. What am I missing if this is not the norm? Awesome. I had people lobby me all week long for which question they thought I ought to do. And I got to be honest with you guys, those, Tammy knew exactly what was going to happen. She knows I'm an overachiever. I can't help myself. I said, I'm going to answer them both. I've got to do them both. We've got to do them both. So what I did, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, thanks. You might want to save that till the end of the sermon. We don't know yet. We don't know how it's going to work out yet. So, um, so this is how I merged the two together just to help myself out. And if you don't feel like I did a good job of mer- merging them together, um, I don't know, ask a great question next year and don't let them give me options. But this is how I merged. I said, why aren't all Adventist churches like whole life? How do we stay focused on Jesus when we aren't in agreement with other people within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination? Did that do a pretty good job of taking the two of them together? Are we okay with that? Okay. Less enthusiastic, I will say, than the first time around, but that's okay. That's all right. That's, it's all good. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, uh, boy, do I need you to help me answer this one. Because, Jesus, I am grateful for all the other churches that are out there. I'm grateful for people who I know have committed their lives to trying to bring people to you. And that includes people inside our Seventh-day Adventist denomination and outside who I know love you. And so I don't want to be disparaging of anyone. And yet I also want to celebrate the amazing things about whole life and our Seventh-day Adventist family of churches. So I just pray that you would help me to have the right words to say. In fact, I'd really love it if you would talk and not me. We pray in your name. Amen. So I have a strong conviction that in order to understand where you're at, you really need to understand where you've been. And so I hope you'll be tolerant if I give you a brief history of the Seventh-day Adventist faith. It's going to be brief, right? Because I'm supposed to preach for 20 minutes. Let's be honest. It's not going to be 20 minutes. So settle down and uh, sit in. Okay, here we go. Um, but uh, a brief history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And really, in order to go back to the beginnings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you would probably need to go all the way back to Jesus, because that's where the Christian faith emerges out of Judaism. And, And then we go on through history. There's the Protestant Reformation that occurs. But the real true roots of the Seventh-day Adventist Church come in about 1790, when an event happened in the United States called the Second Great Awakening. It was a time of religious revival within Protestantism in the 
uh, in the United States. Um, people were getting back into the Bible, that people were enthusiastic about church. They're saying their Bibles. They're looking for answers. And in the midst of that, between 1790 and into the early 1800s, there was a gentleman by the name of William Miller. And William Miller was really excited to study his Bible. And he wasn't really particularly interested in being a preacher, but that's what wound up happening. He kind of became a preacher. And in his study of the Bible, he really got into prophecy, really got excited about that, and got into the book of Daniel and found a little passage in there that said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And so he started doing his, uh, his detective work, and he thought, okay, the sanctuary must be this earth, and if it's going to be cleansed, that must be Jesus coming back. And so if I can figure out when the 23 days, 100 days began, then I can figure out where it ends, and I can figure out where Jesus is coming back. And there's a couple of you here who are like, well, didn't Jesus say no man knows the day nor the hour? Well, you know, sometimes when we get on a little tangent, sometimes we forget to look at the whole Bible in its context, or we go ahead and try to find ways to go ahead and make it work with what, where we're trying to go, Right. It can be a little dangerous sometimes like that. And that's, that's what kind of happened to William Miller. And I got to tell you, I, I have some sympathy for him. And the reason I do is because one of my ancestors was actually a Millerite preacher. Um, so my family goes about as far back in the Seventh-day Adventist church as you possibly can go back. Um, and so I have a little sympathy because I know that my ancestor was pretty deeply disappointed by what, what turned up. Because as we all know, sitting here today... Jesus didn't show up in 1844, did he? And so there was a lot of disappointment over that because a lot of people had gone ahead and put their life savings, their their whole lives into this, believing that Jesus was going to come back. And so some of those people kind of went back into the churches that they'd been in. But then there was another group of people that said, you know, we really think that something must have happened. There must be something that happened here. And so they really started examining their Bibles. And there was a number of different things that came out of it. But basically what I would tell you is this group of people said everything's on the table. Theologically, we're going to go back and we're going to question everything. But, you know, for instance, most people go to church on Sunday. They said, why? And they started reading their Bibles. They came to the conclusion that they should be not only attending church on Saturday, but that they should actually be worshiping on from sundown on Friday night till sundown Saturday night. And so they, they kind of they, they so they kind of started going against the grain with that. And then they they started going against the grain with what the way people were dressing. The uh, women, you can be grateful for the the dress reform in the Seventh day Adventist Church because women were wearing these corsets that were like you know really tight and terrible. And and uh, the Seventh day Adventist Church said, you know, that's that's not necessary. That's that's restrictive. That's not good. And so there are a number of what we ate, that, that became a discussion point. Um, one topic that, that was, uh, became a hot debate was over the Trinity. Was that just a, a doctrine that was made up or was that something that was real? And for a while, many of the Seventh-day Adventist leaders went into what would be called the anti-Trinitarian movement. They said there is not a Trinity, there's only one God, that's what the Bible says. But what's fascinating is because they debated and because they discussed, what happened is the church went back. These same leaders said, you know what, maybe we weren't right about that. But everything was out on the table. Everything was up for debate. Everything was worth having a discussion about. And people weren't shunned just because they thought, well, is that is that the way it's supposed to be? Because that's what happens when you start getting into orthodoxy Christianity or religion in general. As soon as you, you kind of get into it, you start getting set in your ways and you goes, that's the way it has to be, right? But that's not what the early Seventh-day Adventist movement said. And they said, well, question everything. Study the Bible for yourself. Take a look and see what it says. It's all on the table. Let's take a look at it. One of the things that Seventh-day Adventists were really passionate about was the law. They got really passionate about keeping the commandments. Seventh-day Sabbath, found in the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall they labor and do all they work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. Well, they, got, they got passionate about that. And they said, you know what? Christianity has thrown the law out, and we need to get back to keeping the law. We need to keep the law. And they really got, got going on that. Uh, and so... One of the things that they did is they created some material for their preachers and evangelists to have a look at. And I'd like to show you a, um, a, a, an engraving that was made and first published in 1876. James White was responsible for having this published. And pastors and preachers and, and evangelists used this to explain. It was called the way of life. In other words, how to obtain salvation. 
This is, this is what, they, uh, that, what they put out. And so their evangelists would go and they would say, okay, so you see, you can see where, you know, Cain kills Abel. You can see the fallout of the Garden of Eden. You can kind of see all these things. What, what do you, what's prominent here? What's the most prominent thing in the picture? Say again. I would say it wasn't the cross. I would say it, there's something that kind of comes above that, right? It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with the law hanging on it, right? The law is above Jesus. And so that's the, what they were kind of preaching and teaching. Keep the law, keep the law, keep the law. But something interesting happened. Because everything was on the table, they kept reading their Bibles. And suddenly, some people came out of the woodwork and they said, you know what? We aren't saved by keeping the law. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're saved by our faith in Jesus and his grace. That's how we're saved. And so what happened was James White said, you know what? He was kind of convinced. He said, you know what? Maybe this, this picture that I had engraved that we've been handing out to all our preachers and evangelists, maybe we need to change that. And so in, in 1880, he actually asked somebody, to, to, an engraver, to make a new picture, but he died before that picture could come out. And so his wife, Ellen, and her children actually raised the money to finish having this engraving done. And so they had a new engraving made. Do you see a difference in it? A little bit of a difference, right? What's prominent in this picture? Jesus, the cross. You see... The early Seventh-day Adventist church was never afraid to change its beliefs if it matched up with the Bible. They were never afraid just to put it on the table and say, what's going on? And I got to tell you that this picture that was published in 1883 and the righteousness by faith movement that happened in 1888 were not popular. Prominent people in the Seventh-day Adventist church opposed it. Ellen White was in favor of it. And through the letters that you see from her, you'll notice that, that, that she, she got pretty severe opposition for suggesting that Jesus was prominent and that the law was really not even in the picture there. So much so that uh, she was given an opportunity to go to Australia in 1890. As pastors, if, you don't, if you're not a pastor, when you're given an opportunity, it's not because you necessarily want to be given an opportunity always. And it's pretty clear from some of the things that Ellen, Ellen wrote that she didn't feel like she was sent to Australia because they felt like she'd be the best messenger, person to go there. It was because they're trying to get her out of the picture because of her support for this idea that Jesus, period, not an and, not a but, just a period. Jesus, period. In fact, this is what she kind of wrote about this. And I think we need to really think of it. She wrote, you will meet those who will say you are too much excited over the matter. You're too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. As people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. In case you're not reading that, uh, you know, 19th century writing clearly, that's not a good thing, okay, to be dry. That's not a good thing. We must preach Christ in the law, and there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food to the famishing flock of God. We must not trust in our own merits at all. Can you say that again? We, that's not me saying it, by the way. This is something that Ellen White wrote in 1890 in the Review and Herald. We must not trust in our own good deeds, that would be merits, good deeds at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. So the thing about it is, is that even ever since that time from the early foundings, and really honestly in Christianity, there's this, been this struggle between following rules 
and living in relationship that continues on to us today. And the longer a church is around, the easier it is to say, no, 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 we can't have discussion. This has been decided. And so to start off the question, why are not all Seventh Avenue churches like Whole Life Church? Well, because there's a lot of differences out there. There's been a lot of time that's gone by. But what I want to point you to is this. Can I be honest with you? When I was looking to come here, I had some people say, I don't know, Ken, Whole Life Church really isn't an Adventist church. (laughs) Can we just be honest with each other for a minute? Okay, all right, all right, all right. But I looked into you because I'll, I'll tell you this, and I, and I told your board this when I was being interviewed, because I asked, I said, I've had people tell me that. Is it true? And they said, no, that's not true. And I said, because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I like being a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I'm not interested in being anything else. I love the Seventh-day Adventist church with all her faults <laughs> and problems. Like I said, my family goes way back. This matters to me. But let me show you something. Because I think it's important for you to understand. Take a look at our side-by-side. This is the official World Seventh-day Adventist Church mission statement. We make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all the people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' message in preparation for his soon return. What's the whole life church mission statement? Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. I just want to argue with you that our mission statements are identical, except we were able to make it shorter. (laughs) Right? Loving. Do you see that? Loving witnesses, loving people into a lifelong friendship with God, making disciples. We're Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church's mission is our mission. And when you look at the method, I want you to look at it in context, the method of the Seventh-day Adventist method. Look at it in context of our vision and values. Guided by the Bible and the Holy Spirit, Seventh-day Adventists pursue this mission through Christ-like living, communicating, discipling, teaching, healing, and serving. Does that look a little bit like being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community, where we love, accept, forgive, show grace, believe that the Bible is the word of God, worship? and participate? I want to tell you it is. It is. So going back to that question, well, well, then why why would anybody say that we're not a Seventh-day Adventist church then? Well, I want to show you a picture of my family. I told you in my first sermon about my grandpa, right? My grandpa wept more in the values he passed on to us. You know, we talked about God, integrity, safety, hard work, and fun. And you know, he passed that to my dad. My dad is one of four brothers. He has a sister. And you can, you can see the whole family up there, cousins and everything. That's their 50th wedding anniversary. Those are all Wetmores up there. But I want to tell you something. It's an interesting thing. We didn't all vote the same in the last election. Our, our family looked a lot like America did. There's, there, was a, there are a number of different ways that people voted in that family. I also want to suggest to you that that there's a number of different ways that people in that family worship. They worship in different ways. I have family members who wouldn't feel comfortable worshiping here. And I have family members that would (laughs) die to be here. I have family members that, that, that live differently than I do. They, they feel like maybe the, 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 those values of God, integrity, safety, hard work, and fun, that maybe hard work is more important than than maybe the integrity part, maybe. In other words, they apply the values differently. We're all Wetmores. I think my grandfather has profoundly influenced all of us, but we just apply the values a little bit differently. So I want to suggest to you the reason why not every Seventh-day Adventist church looks the same is because we all apply the values a little bit differently. We don't always see things that, that what's most important the same. Sometimes it's just a genuine difference. It's like different flavors of ice cream. You like that flavor, I like that flavor. And other times it's more like money. A $100 bill is superior to a $5 bill. I don't care. It may be printed on the same money, but I guarantee you if I make you choose, you're going to take the $100 bill. And there's sometimes where there are differences in our family that are 
a value thing. This is superior. But for whatever reason, from their point of view, it's not. But what I want to suggest to you is that we're still family. I love all those people. I love the ones that didn't vote the same way I voted. I love the ones that that don't worship the same as I do. They're my family. I don't want to change my last name. I don't want them to change their last name. I'd like for them to be a little bit smarter about how they vote, but I can't, I can't force that. I can't force that. You following me? Are you with me? Is this a metaphor that makes sense? Paul says it a little bit differently in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 18 and 25. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. God has created each one of us to play a part in the body of Christ. And I also believe that we can expand that. And I am taking a little bit of license here, but I can expand that. I believe you can expand that out to churches, that each church, that churches can be parts of the body as well. Some churches are the hands of Jesus. Some Churches are the feet of Jesus, and some churches, well, they're what gets rid of the excrement in our body. <laughs> and if you don't, if you think that I'm like really taking liberties now with 1 Corinthians 12, go and read it because Paul actually says there are parts of our body that are less honorable, but they require extra care. Okay, but it doesn't mean that they don't have value and purpose. Aren't we glad that there's a part of our body that gets rid of excrement? It'd be terrible if that just built up in your body and never was released. But what happens is we like to go ahead and label you're bad. You're not doing it the way I'm doing it. So that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. As opposed to appreciating each other for what we bring to the body of Christ. That's where we've got to change our viewpoint. So then what happens when we do deal with those people who say to us, well, you're not doing it the way that you ought to be doing it. They start picking, picking, picking. Well, I want to go ahead and make a couple suggestions to you. I want to tell you who I think Whole Life Church is. And if you want to disagree with me later, you're more than welcome to. But I think that Whole Life Church is Jesus-centered period. I think that Jesus is at the center of everything that we want to be doing here, period. We want to point people to Jesus. And I want to suggest to you that this is a church that I think that God has put in a special place to reach out to people who don't know Jesus. I think there's some churches that are out there that are good for kind of retaining the people that Jesus has brought to himself. And and maybe that's their part in the body to play. But I think that our church, that what we do here at Whole Life Church is that we have a special mission to people who don't know Jesus. In other words, our goal isn't to get people from the other Adventist churches or even the other Baptist or Methodist churches in town to come to this church. Our goal is to get people who don't know Jesus to come to this church. That's what we're here to do. That's what our focus is on. That means that our church has got to be a little bit more open-minded and able to go ahead and have difficult decisions, discussions with people without taking a real, you know, hand in your fist or your fist in your face kind of approach. We need to be able to be like those early Adventists who say, hey, it's all on the table. We're open to that discussion. You want to talk about that? Let's talk about that. We're going to love you if you disagree with us at the end. I think there's nothing more Adventist than that, by the way. And I have Aunt Ellen to agree with me on that. (laughs) Let's read this one. Ellen says this, the truth of God is progressive. Can I say that one more time? The truth of God is progressive. It is always onward, going from strength to a greater strength, from light to a greater light. We have every reason to believe that the Lord will send us increased truth for a greater work is yet to be done. In our knowledge of the truth, there is at first a beginning in our understanding of it, then a progression, then completion, first the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full ear of corn. Much has been lost because our ministers and people have concluded that we have had all the truth essential for us as a people. But such a conclusion, 
is erroneous and in harmony with the deceptions of Satan. You can't be any stronger than that, can you? The idea that we have it all figured out, and there's nothing else to learn, that, according to Ellen White, is in harmony with the deceptions of Satan. For the truth will be constantly unfolding. There are men among us, no, she didn't say women, there are men among us who profess to understand the truth for these days, but will not calmly investigate advanced truth. People get worked up. Oh, you can't talk about that. Let's talk, calmly talk about it. They're determined to make no advance beyond the stakes which they have set and will not listen to those they say who do not stand by the old landmarks. They're so self-sufficient that they cannot be reasoned with. They considered a virtue to be at variance. I looked up the word variance in the 1800s Webster's Dictionary. It means to be in conflict with. They think it's a virtue to be fighting with and to be like, you're wrong, you're wrong. At variance with their brethren and close the door that light shall not find an entrance to the people of God. It will require heavenly wisdom to know how to deal with such cases. So how do we deal with it when we don't always agree? It will take heavenly wisdom. How do we deal with it, though? It's hurtful when people suggest that you're less than because you don't agree on a topic. And it gets really hard when it's a theological topic. So how do we deal with it when when we get criticism? I've seen some things on the Internet about this church. How do we deal with that? Well, I want to tell you really quick, because this is second service, so if you want the short version, go to first service. I'll never forget when I worked in news. One of my mentors was a guy named John Anderson. He was a legend in broadcasting. John was amazing. And I remember I got really worked up because one of our competitors started bashing us on the air for a news story that we had done. And it was a good news story, and they were wrong to be bashing us. And so I went to John. I said, we need to do a story. We need to go after them for their bad reporting, blah, 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 blah. We need to do this. And I'll never forget what this man said to me. He said, why? He said, Ken, I don't really care what my competitors are doing. He said, what I strive to do is the best broadcast that we can do. If we're right, then that will come out. If we're wrong, then we deserve to be called out. But I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it, and I'm certainly not going to give it time by replying to it. I think we're number one, and I'm not going to be bothered by the number two that's yapping at my heels. I'm going to leave that as a parable of Jesus for you to figure out what I mean by that. You can take it where you want. But what I want to suggest to you is this. When people disagree with us, we can get all upset, we can get all in a bind, or we can simply say, somebody's disagreeing with me. I wonder if there's any merit to it. If there is, I need to change. If there isn't, I need to go ahead and keep doing what I'm doing. But what I don't need to do is be in a fight and be angry and upset and let myself get carried away into unchristlike behavior. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding us as shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Next time you get discouraged because somebody's picking on you, just think about how much they picked on Jesus. How they tried to trap him, how they were always after him. Think of all the hostility Jesus endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in the struggle against sin. 
family, when we start feeling discouraged, when we see these hot potatoes that people are fixating on, these cultural preference that they're getting all up, let's not go ahead and go down that route. Rather, let's go ahead and put our eyes on Jesus, remember what he went through, and then get back to the mission that God has given us. It's not about labels. It's not about conservative versus progressive. It's about Jesus. It's about a relationship with him. It's about knowing him. As a whole life family, I invite you to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And when you do, the things of earth will grow strangely dim and the light of his glory and grace. All right, and now it is time for me to ask your questions to Ken. If you haven't submitted a question, you can do so on wholelife.church slash live or on Facebook. Just find today's video and uh, post a question right there. We already have some questions in. So here we go. Uh, great sermon, by the way. Um, I grew up as an Adventist and um, heard a lot of things about how we had more truth than everyone else. Um, and uh, someone asked the question, Denise asked the question, why do we need so many religions? Uh, we all could be one church with openness to new information as it's revealed. What about the remnant? That's kind of two questions in one, but why, why so many denominations if if we have the truth, should we just take over or why to combine? I don't know. Yes. The empire. Um, why so many denominations? I think that there are so many denominations because there are um, so many people trying to get at what truth is. Um, I do believe that there's, there is absolute truth out there. Um, and his name is Jesus. Um, and there are, and so what happens over the years is that denominations split trying to go after what they believe the truth of Jesus or the Bible um, is or what the truth, uh, if they're not a Christian, that the truth that they perceive to be out there. Um, so I think it's counterproductive to try to create one church because then you're trying to lump everybody into one set of beliefs that sometimes conflict with each other. In other words, um, the things that I believe can be in 180 degree opposition to what you believe. And so it's not probably a good fit for us um, to be necessarily together because we're not, because you're telling people one thing, I'm telling people another thing. And so that's where I think the value of denominations come in, you know, and where um, that, that we can have that belief that we have about what truth is. Or, or to keep your metaphor of parts of the body, we couldn't function if we had hands on our feet necessarily. Um, well, this the Seventh Adventist Church owes a huge debt to um, to many theologians who were not Seventh Day Adventists, um, but helped us find our beliefs, and actually in the years since have helped us grow as well. Um, the Seventh Day Adventist Church is not the only repository of good theological thought in the world. Um, and I think that means that we can learn from people from other denominations. And I know that that becomes wildly unpopular in some circles, but what happens is that when you only, um, when you only feast on what you've regurgitated, um, you're not going to be particularly healthy. And so it's, it's helpful to read other things and say, do I agree with this or do I disagree with it? We don't read, we read it with a critical mindset. We say, is this true or is it not? Does it line up with what I am seeing in the Bible or does it not? Does it line up with the experience I have or not? But what happens is when we only read the same thing over and over, we blind ourselves to other things that are out there. And this is not what early Adventists did. Um, Ellen White has caught a lot of flack from borrowing from other resources, but that's it, it. To me, it just shows that she was actually interested in what other people had to say and found worth there. I think it's actually worth thinking about that if that that we 
can look at things and, and really learn some things from other places. It doesn't mean we accept everything, but it means that we look at it critically and, and think, wow, that there's something really beautiful there or eh, nothing really there that I want to take away. And with uh, Denise's follow-up question about what about the remnant? The remnant, uh, maybe we need a definition of what that is. I believe that would be like the last people. Here's what I'm going to say to Denise. I'm going to say turn that in in a great question next next year because I am um, the, the remnant. When we start talking about the remnant, I had a friend who got fired because he was sitting in a seat that I'm sitting in similar to now. And he um, – he was actually teaching a Bible class in a high school and uh, he was taking questions at the end of the class. And they said, sir, do you believe that the Adventist church is the remnant church? And he said, no. And the bell rang and they walked out <laughs> and he didn't get to follow up on what he was wanting to say. Um, and, and so I like my job and I would like <laughs> to make sure that I give the full context of what I think. I believe that the seventh day Adventist church is God's remnant church. I do believe that, but I don't believe that means that people outside of it are excluded or are not going to be in heaven or anything like that. What I do believe is that we have a special privilege to share a beautiful picture of Jesus with the world. And it's a privilege and a responsibility, not a we're better than anybody else. Does that make sense? So that's good. I don't know. I'm I have at least one more question that could get you fired, but we yeah, will have to it. save it. Well, um, we're there. We're all right. Let's just go down the road. We will have to save it because we are out of time. Oh. I'm sorry, but um, check that out on the podcast. It's called This Is Whole Life. Available. So what's the question? Because so that give people a reason to tune into the podcast sure, to find out if I'm going to get fired uh, or not. It was a question that I don't think could be answered in this short amount of time. If I can find it here, it is... Um, How do we mend the divide between the two conferences? Um, (laughs) Well, let's tune into the podcast. (laughs) Yep, which is uh, a very complex issue. And uh, so (laughs) if you don't know what we're talking about, yeah, this is a whole nother sermon. And uh, I actually have a friend I hope to bring in here sometime to talk about that that I think we'll find very interesting. But definitely podcast. Yep. Check that. That takes a longer answer. Um, however, one last be question. in between now and then for me. <laughs> yeah. Now you have time to think about it. Yes. Um, this is the last great question in this series. I'm glad that it's coming back because I've enjoyed it too. So here we go. The last great question. All right. <clears throat> Considering the story of Hagar and Sarah. All right. Another complex issue. Um, in the Genesis version, there's a lot of uh, difficult complexity. For instance, God sends Hagar back into bondage, then tells uh, Abraham to listen to Sarah and cast Hagar and her and her son Ishmael out into the wilderness. Then Paul does a really horrible retelling of this story in Galatians. Um, I'm not familiar with his retelling, but it must be bad. Um, <laughs> Paul says the, a lot of things that are difficult to understand, yeah. uh, to quote Peter. <laughs> and then uh, he makes a point that we all like, which is that faith trumps the law, but he does it in a way that has resulted in much interreligious strife, gender opposition, etc. Why do all of these horrible things seem sanctioned by or even motivated by God? That's the great question. That's going to be a good one. All right. Well, good for me to listen to anyway. Did you enjoy the last uh, last sermon in the series this week? Uh, some of them caught it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we're going to do this. I'm really looking forward to this. I, uh, it's interesting how God leads because I actually just finished a book that was directly addressing this topic on Friday. So this will be fun. And I, it, this wasn't planned. So as far as I haven't been told about this, so this is pretty cool. Very I'm excited. Cool. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Have I ever told you how lucky I am to be your pastor? I love it. I really, I'm serious about that. I just feel so blessed. Thank you so much for having me here. And I I just love you all. You're fantastic. Um, You know, this week, I just want to remind you, this week, I want to uh, remind you to go be Jesus in your community, wherever you are. Go be the Jesus that people need to see. Don't worry about what the people are saying about you. You go do what Jesus told you to go do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Be with us. Be beside us. Walk with us. We ask you to do that because we love you and we like being with you, but also because there's a lot of people that we know that we know their life would be better if you were a part of it. And so we want them to see you in us. Help us to do it. Um, help us to allow you to reflect out of us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. God bless you. You know I love you. Have a great week. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church and our podcasts, Speaking of Grace and its companion, 15 with Andy, Randy, and Jeff, are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians all focused through the lens of grace. Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening, and have a great week.